Maori community here who are deeply worried about the ethnic cleansing. What is happening to try to reduce the flow of weapons and to get urgent humanitarian aid to the 24 million people who desperately need it? Minister. Well, my right honourable friend is entirely right in, in what she says. We have recently contributed £600,000 to open source investigative um, uh, reporting to verify and preserve information on attacks on civilians and breaches of international humanitarian law. As, as she will know, we are providing £22 million of support uh, for uh, Sudan, £5 million recently announced to help people who have gone across the border into Chad and into South uh, Sudan. Um, and uh, she will also know that in the, on the humanitarian front, something like 19 or 19 humanitarian, humanitarian workers have been uh, murdered. But we are doing everything we can to try and get aid and help in. Question number two, Mr. Speaker. Foreign Secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with permission, I will answer questions 2, 10, 12, 17, 20, and 23 together. Uh, since Hamas's uh, brutal terror attacks on the 7th of Octo uh, October. My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, and I have uh, visited uh, the region and spoken and met extensively with counterparts, uh, totalling uh, almost 20 countries as part of our extensive diplomatic efforts to prevent escalation, to sustain the prospe uh, prospect of regional peace, and of course to secure uh, the uh, free movement home of British nationals. Uh, in Gaza and the release of those uh, hostages. Chris Lott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It has been reported that the Palestinian Authority is to pay up to $3 million a month in so called martyr salaries to the families of dead and captured Hamas terrorists. Will my right honourable friend join me in condemning these payments to rapists, torturers, murderers, some of whom have killed Brits? And will he uh, also use his good offices to ensure that no British aid money has gone towards this filthy practice? Yeah. So, uh, I can reassure him that we always ensure that uh, UK aid money uh, is protected from uh, misappropriation, and I can confirm to him and the House that no British aid money goes directly to the uh, Palestinian uh, Authority. We have raised this very issue with the Palestinian Authority and highlighted our belief that this is not conducive to uh, good relations and a future two-state solution. So Desmond Swain. What are the prospects of a two-state solution, given the pace uh, of settlements on the West Bank, Israeli settlements? Uh, the the government's long-standing position is that we oppose settlement expansion uh, and the reasons I have uh, I've, uh, highlighted extensively. In both the conversations that I have had with the Israeli government and the uh, leadership of uh, other countries in the region, despite the terrible circumstances we are currently experiencing, there is a renewed desire to have a meaningful resolution that means the circumstances that we saw, the terrible uh, images that we saw on the 7th of October, can and will never be repeated. Marshal de Cordova. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Close to 1,000 constituents have contacted me deeply concerned about the situation in Gaza, the humanitarian crisis unfolding and the need for a ceasefire. Nearly 5,000 people have died in Gaza, including 1,700 children. While this whole House rightly condemned the Hamas atrocities, we must be unequivocal in our condemnation of violations of international law. So can the Minister set out what circumstances does he believe it is legal for Israel to cut off water, fuel, food and electricity in Gaza? Uh, Mr Speaker, the, uh, I know there is there's always much debate in this House about the interpretation of uh, international law, international humanitarian law. I have raised, I have raised this issue directly with my Israeli counterparts about the need in, uh, in whatever uh, actions they take to secure their protection, to defend Israeli citizens and to secure the release of hostages, that they should do so in accordance with uh, international law. I have received assurances from the uh, Israeli President uh, to that effect. Speaker, there has been countless reiterations from is Israeli authorities, including a joint speech with the Prime Minister last week, that they are taking precautions to avoid civilian casualties. However, more than 4,650 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza in the last 16 days. 
Mr Speaker, Palestinian lives matter, so what more other than just repeating promises for <coughs> civilian protection is your department taking meaningfully to ensure that innocent Palestinians are being kept safe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm on record of uh, mourning the Palestinian lives that have been lost in this conflict, just as we mourn and I mourn the loss of Israeli lives in this terrible uh, situation, so I can assure him the UK government takes the loss of life where, from whoever, whichever community, we take that incredibly seriously. I would remind him and the House that Hamas routinely, consciously, puts civilians in harm's way, specifically to, uh, uh, to, to generate fatalities which they then use as part of their media operations. Um, uh, we are conscious of that. The Israeli armed forces are conscious of that. That is why, they explained to me, that is why they have given notice as to the future areas of military operation. And we have seen uh, uh, evidence that Huma uh, Hamas are routinely preventing Palestinians leaving areas which are going to be engaged by the uh, Israeli Defence Forces. Oh, thank you, Speaker. In contrast to the last two questions from the opposing side, I thank my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State and our Prime Minister for their important recent visits to our ally Israel. The Government's unequivocal message that Israel has the right and must be able to defend itself against the Hamas terrorist group is right and just. What steps is my right honourable friend taking to also support Israel in its efforts to secure the release of 200 plus captives still held in Gaza? including any British citizens, and can the Secretary of State ensure they receive immediate assistance from the International Red Cross? Uh, my uh, my honourable friend uh, reminds the House that, uh, that, that we remain focused, the Government remains focused on the protection of British nationals uh, in Israel, on the West Bank, and of course uh, in Gaza. Uh, whilst I can't go into, it would be inappropriate for me to go into details, I, I can assure him and the House uh, that we speak with all parties with, uh, who we believe could have influence on those uh, holding uh, hostages, uh, Hamas, Palestinian um, uh, Islamic Jihad and others. It is incredibly uh, difficult. We don't have direct lines of communications, but we will not rest. We will not rest in uh, trying to secure the release of uh, hostages and the, um, uh, and the evacuation of British nationals from Gaza. Mr Speaker, thank you. I'm clear that the international community, backed by the UN, must now work together to dial down the rhetoric, open humanitarian corridors, encourage restraint and to protect life. Will the Foreign Secretary commit the UK to expanding the Abraham Accords as a priority, which will not only bring strategic partners to the table, but it may also offer a future peace between Israel and Palestine? Uh, I have regularly uh, said about how uh, how much I value the uh, Abraham Accords, the improving of relationships uh, between Israel and the uh, Arab nations in its near neighbourhood, I think is an incredibly positive step. Uh, there is realistic uh, belief that part of the attack of the 7th of October was to derail future normalisation and negotiations. And again, I think this highlights the fact that Hamas are not a friend to the Palestinian uh, people. They are not trying to improve relationships between Israel and the Arab world. They brought down the Oslo agreements. They have consistently uh, uh, blocked all attempts to normalise relationships uh, between Israel and the wider uh, Arab world. We must not let them win in that endeavour, and we must work to bring peace between the Palestinian people and the Israelis. Show the select committee, Sarah Champion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've been inundated with emails from constituents terrified for the future of the internally displaced Palestinians in Gaza. Since the 7th of October, nearly 600,000 IDPs are sheltering in 150 UNRWA facilities. 35 UNRWA staff have been killed. 40 UNRWA installations have been damaged. Foreign Secretary, when the ground invasion inevitably starts, where are these people meant to go? Who is expected to host them? Who will be administering them? And where will the support come from? And fundamentally, what does the Foreign Secretary believe the Israeli politicians' long-term objective actually is? Uh, 
All the conversations that we have had uh, with uh, Israel, with Egypt, and with uh, intermediaries who are able to uh, maintain lines of communications with Hamas have been about the uh, preservation of human life. I will put on record once again, we completely support Israel's right and indeed duty of self-defense. Uh, the, the brutality, and we are now only just starting to see the scale of the brutality, video evidence that has been retrieved from those individuals who brutalized and murdered Israeli citizens on the 7th of October has now been put in the public domain, and it is worse than any of us could have imagined. So we absolutely stand by Israel's right to self-defense, and we have said that we want to work with uh, Israel, with Egypt, with the countries uh, in the near neighbourhood and, of course, with those who are the de facto uh, government in, uh, uh, in Gaza to minimise civilian casualties. We have had that commitment from Israel. We have had no such commitment from Hamas. Imran uh, Mr Speaker, since I raised the question with the Prime Minister last week, Indiscriminate airstrikes and the total siege on food, water and medical supplies have killed thousands of innocent Palestinian men and women and over 1,000 children. So let us be absolutely clear in this House. This is now beyond a humanitarian catastrophe. Even as we stand here today, the innocent blood continues to be spilled on the streets of Gaza. Mosques, churches, schools, hospitals, bakeries, water plants and homes continue to be flattened by the Israelis question for the Foreign Secretary. Just what will it take? How many thousands of innocent Palestinians must be slaughtered before this government condemns this brutality and bloodshed? Uh, Mr Speaker, we have consistently said that we want to minimise further loss of life, that the uh, lives lost of the Palestinian people uh, is something that, uh, of course, we grieve. But we must never lose sight of the fact that during that period of time, uh, since the 7th of October, thousands of rockets have been fired from Gaza into Israel. Indeed, we now have uh, uh, an assessment that one of the most high-profile loss of lives uh, in Gaza, something that was covered extensively on the British and international media, was likely caused by a rocket emanating from Gaza targeting Israel. So I respect, I respect the right, I respect the honourable gentleman's passion uh, about the preservation of life. I can assure him that I share his passion. But we must, we must, we must be thoughtful, and we must remember why this is happening. The single largest murder of Jews since the Holocaust, initiated by Hamas, who then put Palestinians intentionally in harm's way as part of their operations, must not be forgotten about. Sir Jake Barrett. Speaker, one of the appalling hallmarks of the, uh, the terrorism attack by Hamas on the State of Israel has been hostage-taking, and we are seeing hostage-taking now increasingly being used in state-sponsored terrorism. With that in mind, and with the number of hostages who are British currently being held, does my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, think that now is the time to appoint a prime ministerial envoy for hostages with full diplomatic immunity so the British state can keep in touch with Britons who are being held and use our soft power to negotiate to seek their release? Uh, my, my right honourable friend raise, uh, raises an important point. We, we have uh, one of the largest and most effective diplomatic networks, so uh, our diplomats on the ground are often uh, the best place uh, to initiate those negotiations. Uh, but he does raise a good point, and I will take, it uh, I will take his suggestion seriously. Rachel Hopkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, like many others, have received hundreds, if not thousands, of emails from my constituents with expressing their despair at what they're seeing happening in Gaza. It's more than a humanitarian emergency. Does the Minister agree with Labour's calls to work with international partners to give UN agencies such as UNRWA the long-term resources they need, as well as insisting that fuel is allowed into Gaza? Uh, the, 
the Prime Minister, myself, and indeed my right honourable uh, friend, uh, the Development Minister, have had extensive and regular talks uh, on ensuring that humanitarian supply, uh, supplies get to the uh, Palestinian people in Gaza. Uh, and indeed, my, my right honourable friend has virtually daily uh, uh, conversations with Martin Griffiths, the head of OCHA. The Prime Minister has recently announced an additional £30 million of humanitarian support on top of our pre-existing £27 million, making us one of the most generous contributing nations to humanitarian support for Palestinians in Gaza. Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lamy. Yeah. Mr Speaker, George Mitchell, the great American peacemaker, said diplomacy was 700 days of failure and one of success. Labour recognises the hard, quiet diplomacy required to secure the release of hostages and eventually long-term peace. But in this bloody war, we cannot afford 700 days without success. Overnight, we saw reports of the possible release of 50 hostages, only to learn that those talks had stumbled. Can he update the House on the progress to secure the release of all 200 hostages so cruelly taken by Hamas terrorists? Um, I thank the uh, honourable gentleman uh, throughout this for the, uh, the calm professionalism that he has displayed. I can assure him and the House that this remains uh, uh, an absolute focus of uh, our attention. Uh, it was raised by the uh, Prime Minister, by me, by, uh, as I say, my right honourable friend, the Development Minister, and others in our bilateral conversations with leaders around the region. We will stay relentlessly focused on this, I can assure him. David Lamy. Mr Speaker, the situation in Gaza is heartbreaking and deeply troubling. Does the Foreign Secretary agree that Israel must follow the laws of war by taking every possible step to protect civilians, ensuring aid is rapid, safe and unhindered, blocks to water, food, medicines, fuel lifted immediately, Palestinians forced to flee are not permanently displaced, and that upholding these laws is not just a legal and moral obligation, but necessary to prevent Israel's campaign from undermining long-term prospects for peace and stability. Uh, Mr Speaker, I can assure the Right Honourable Gentleman that that is exactly the tone of the conversations that we are having. The preservation of civilian life remains a priority. We discuss this regularly and at every level within the uh, Israeli government. And of course, we reflect on the point that Israel itself, as well as the countries in the near neighbourhood, are trying to prevent this becoming a regional conflict. And as I say, professionalism and restraint by the Israeli Defence Forces is an important part of preventing this becoming a regional conflict. SNP spokesperson Brendan O'Hara. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Has the Secretary of State seen any evidence, been made aware of any evidence, or have reasonable grounds to believe that Israel has breached international humanitarian law in its response to the Hamas atrocities on October the 7th? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I am uh, not uh, in a position, it is not my, uh, it's not my role, to make uh, an assessment on the interpretation of events which are unfolding uh, as, uh, as we speak. There will, of course, there will, of course be uh, assessments of the, uh, of the nature of uh, international uh, humanitarian law. We are trying to make sure that in all of its actions, uh, in its legitimate self-defence, Israel does abide by international law. Mr. Speaker, if it's not his responsibility to make that assessment, I wonder then whose it is, because he knows that international humanitarian law is unambiguous in saying that a collective punishment against a civilian population is illegal. So is he telling us that he is unaware or has seen no evidence that people have been forced from their homes, that their water has been cut off, food has been cut off, power has been cut off, and access to medicine has been cut off? Or is he actually saying that all of this has happened, but the UK government has unilaterally decided that international humanitarian law doesn't actually apply to this conflict? Yeah. 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 Uh, Mr Speaker, he, he, uh, he undermines his own question by making the assertion by making the assertion that his interpretation of uh, international humanitarian law is uh, by default uh, one that I have to uh, subscribe to. Uh, his, his definition of what is happening is not one that I necessarily agree with. Greg Smith. 
Foreign Secretary. Uh, Mr Speaker, with permission, I will answer questions three and eight together. Hamas is responsible for these appalling terrorist attacks. Uh, we know that Iran has been a long-term funder and supporter uh, of, uh, Hamas, uh, of Hamas, Hezbollah uh, and the Palestinian uh, Islamic Jihad. Uh, Israel's support for these militant groups has a destabilising impact on the region and international security, and we remain ever watchful of their actions. Greg Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am grateful to the Foreign Secretary for that answer. Iran's fingerprints are all over Hamas's brutal massacre in Israel. Iran's blatant arming, funding worth $100 million a year, and training of terror groups around the region is just no Leaders have even publicly lavished praise on Iran and the IRGC for its support. So, does my right honourable friend agree with me that we must be absolutely clear about the threat posed by Iran abroad and at home, and that now is time for a policy reset? Uh, so I, I, I completely agree with my honourable friend's uh, uh, assessment of Iran's uh, malign influence. Um, but we, as uh, the government of the, uh, the FCDO, are well aware uh, of this, uh, and I can assure him that we have been clear-eyed throughout the work we do with regard to um, uh, Iran and their influence in the region. We will keep ever watchful. I'm sure no reset is required because we are very conscious of their impact on the region. Rich Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, what diplomatic efforts are His Majesty's Government taking to protect and indeed enhance the Abraham Accords uh, in light of the fact that clearly the Iranian regime is seeking to engender discord and indeed conflict in the Middle East? Uh, my honourable friend uh, is, is, is absolutely right that the Abraham Accords uh, have been a force for good. Uh, we need to protect them, ideally enhance them. Anything which sees greater cooperation between Israel and the Arab world has got to be a step in the right direction when it comes to the creation of that sustainable two-state solution. I can assure him we will remain focused on that as an outcome. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This government has rightly imposed sanctions on those states and organisations which support <coughs> terrorism. Can the Secretary of State therefore clarify that if it is found, following an independent investigation, that Israel has also broken international law and committed war crimes in Gaza, that his government will consider the introduction of appropriate sanctions? Well, Mr Speaker, the, uh, the Honourable Gentleman is inviting me to speculate about uh, our future response to future uh, uh, events. Uh, at the moment, I'm dealing with the events in the here and now. I'm trying to prevent the loss of life. I'm in uh, constant conversations with the leadership in the region to try and uh, prevent further Israeli and Palestinian loss of life. Mr Speaker, yesterday I had the privilege of meeting families whose loved ones have been taken hostage, who have come here to share their testimony. It was deeply moving. And they raised the fact that Iran is very much behind this. So I ask the Foreign Secretary, why have we yet to prescribe the IRGC? Surely it was time back a year ago, but surely now. What's the excuse for waiting? Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, the, uh, the plight of the people, the families, who have uh, either lost loved ones or have lost one, uh, loved ones uh, still held hostage in, in, in Gaza is one that I have a huge amount of sympathy for, and I'll be um, meeting with uh, families who have uh, members uh, held hostage later on. Um, we are well aware of Iran's influence. As I have regularly said, any decision about prescription will be a cross-government decision. The, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of doing that will always be held, uh, will always be at the heart of any decision-making uh, process. But as she knows, we do not uh, comment on future sanctions or prescriptions designations. Mr. Wayne Devon. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, following on from that question, Labour has been calling for many months for the government to prescribe the IRGC. 
There is evidence emerging of Iranian involvement in the Hamas terrorist attack in Israel. We also understand that the United States has called for the UK to follow its example. So I do press him. When will the government act, either by using existing terrorism legislation or by prescribing a new process of description directed at the IRGC? Uh, I would remind the House that the IRGC is sanctioned in its entirety, as well as certain other individuals who are members of the IRGC. As I have said in response to the Honourable Lady's question, no international measure comes without cost. There are, of course, advantages and disadvantages to uh, prescription, which would fundamentally mean that we could uh, have uh, no direct diplomatic relations uh, with uh, Iran. As I said, we always take these issues very seriously. Any decision that we made will be made across government, but we do not speculate on future sanctions or prescriptions designations. Governor David. Question number four, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The FCDO has referred over 1,450 people under ACRS Pathway 3 to the Home Office. We're supporting over 900 Afghans in third countries, including with accommodation, and we're grateful to Pakistan for the work we do together uh, to this end. And of course, Mr. Speaker, we remain committed to relocating to the UK all eligible Afghan families working closely with the Home Office and Department for Housing to assure they all have suitable accommodation on arrival. Uh, David. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I may, before I answer my question, I'd like to put on record my thoughts go out to everyone impacted by the disturbing scenes we've witnessed in Israel and Palestine. After the evacuation of Afghanistan, I told ministers that many of my constituents have relatives in Afghanistan who work for the British government. What is the minister doing to keep the government's promise for further support to help those the U in the, to, uh, to support those who help the UK's mission in Afghanistan? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We continue our diplomatic efforts, including supporting uh, those Afghans in third countries. Uh, we have relocated more than 21,000 Afghans under both ARAP and ACRS, and that's something we will continue to do. John Barrow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the government made the right decision in lifting the quota for Pathway 3, allowing all eligible British Council contractors to come to the UK. However, many contractors and their families are waiting in Pakistan for clearance to come to the UK because accommodation has yet to be arranged. May I urge the government to resolve this housing issue urgently, given that the Pakistani authorities' threat to return the contractors to Afghanistan next month? This would be a disaster, and we need to sort it out now. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. We are, we are we're acutely aware of the challenge he uh, alludes to. We are working at pace uh, with our mission in Pakistan. And I think it's, uh, we are seized of the uh, natural justice required uh, and, uh, and the fact that we need to do our duty uh, to these people. And that's why our, the, the full pace of our institutional effort is focused on doing just that. And we look forward to keeping colleagues updated. John Mr Limbrock. I'm grateful, Mr Speaker. And I too wish to put on record my um, solidarity with those who are living in fear and heartbreak in Gaza and Israel. The withdrawal of from Afghanistan was an absolute debacle. It's a continuing source of shame for this country because so, so many people who helped us, trusted us, relied on us, have been absolutely abandoned. We're hearing horrifying reports from those who've done the right thing, taken terrible risks to escape to Pakistan, and they're now living in constant fear of arrest or deportation because this government has left them in limbo. So my question is simple. How many are still waiting and how much longer will they have to wait? Yeah. Mr Speaker, respectfully, we haven't left them in limbo. Uh, the situation is extremely difficult. It's difficult because of the depredations, let's be very clear, of uh, the tyrannical regime of the Taliban, which is why we're in this situation in the first place. We have relocated more than 21,000 and we continue to work at pace with our mission in Pakistan and elsewhere to ensure that these people despite the local troubles and difficulties, get the support they need. Deirdre Black. Question five, Mr Speaker. With your permission, I will answer question five, six, nine, eighteen, nineteen, and uh, 21. Um, Mr Speaker, I talk to Martin Griffiths almost uh, every day. He is the head of UN OCHA, and on Friday, 
I attended a meeting with development ministers convened by Samantha Powers, the head of USAID. Uh, how is the Foreign Secretary and his ministers working with international counterparts to prevent any deliberate targeting of civilians and civilian infrastructure in Israel and Palestine? Yeah. Here, here. By drawing to all parties' attention, Mr. Speaker, the international rules of, law, of war. We now come to Vicky Foxwell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. At a vigil outside Parliament this morning, the names of some of the more than 2,000 children killed so far in Gaza were read out. Children in Gaza have begun writing their names on their hands so they can be identified and buried with their families when they are killed. What action is the government taking to prevent more children being harmed in Ms. Israel's military action and to ensure a rapid end to this conflict? Yeah. Yeah. The uh, Prime Minister set out yesterday very clearly what our policy is in this area. We are doing everything we can to protect children and British aid is already making a difference by supporting the international relief effort, which is going in through RAFA. I completely endorse what my honourable friend has just said about the impact on children. Trucks at RAFA crossing are welcome, but obviously the aid that's being uh, getting through is nowhere near enough to avert a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. Fuel is urgently needed for the desalination plants that would ensure drinking water and for the energy generators that would power hospitals, preventing you know, possible you know, huge numbers of lo loss of life. Why is that fuel not being allowed through? Well, the Honourable Lady is entirely right that the Rafa crossing is the only way at the moment we can get uh, food and relief supplies in. Food, is, food and relief supplies are coming to El Arish, and the number of trucks that are going through every day is far too small. And we will continue to press all the relevant authorities to allow humanitarian support and aid of the type that she has described through the Rafa crossing to help those whose circumstances are precisely as she described. Walton Day. Thank you, Mr. Here. Speaker. With thousands of innocent civilians dead, tens of thousands injured, hundreds of thousands displaced, and a denial of humanitarian aid, what level of civilian suffering will it take before this government backs calls for a ceasefire? Here, here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, the Honourable Gentleman sets out the tremendous suffering that is happening, but he, like me, will agree with the Prime Minister that the source of this was the appalling terrorist murderous action by Hamas which, as the Foreign Secretary said a few minutes ago, killed more Jewish people than on any day since the Second World War and the Holocaust. Okay, Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the fighting continues, the UN estimates that around 160 women will give birth every day in Gaza. Meanwhile, the lives of at least 120 newborns in incubators are at risk due to lack of power, fuel, medicine and water. These women and children are not terrorists. Will the Secretary of State listen to the increasing calls for a ceasefire, which would be the best way to ensure the release of hostages who are in a terrible situation and the delivery of aid for Palestinian citizens? In terms of delivering aid and support, I had the opportunity to meet with all the, or a very large number of the British uh, charities and NGOs which are trying to help in Gaza, I keep in very close touch with them. And in so far as the issue of access and support through these trusted agencies is concerned, we will do everything we can to help. Sir Owen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of the thousands of innocent people killed, aid workers are also included in that devastating loss. UN alerts on the ground have made repeated warnings that the current Israeli military strategy could lead to the permanent ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said at the dispatch box that there were mechanisms to deal with breaches of international law. Could the Minister say more on what they are doing to support independent investigations and the ICC? Well, I, th I think the answer to the Honourable Lady's perfectly proper question is that international organisations, legal organisations all around the world will be looking at this and giving their opinions. Mary Robinson. Mr. Speaker, 
people in Chile are deeply concerned about the humanitarian situation in Gaza um, and welcome the doubling of aid which was announced by the Prime Minister. Um, however, we, we know that Hamas has got a history of direct, diverting and mis misusing aid that is given to it for its own terrorist purposes. Um, what steps are we able to take to ensure that this much needed aid gets to the people in need? Yeah. Well, she's quite, right. she's quite right to make that warning about the proper use of aid, Mr Speaker. I can tell her that this is probably the most scrutinised programme that Britain has in terms of humanitarian uh, relief uh, and uh, support. And if ever we see anything which we think is untoward, we immediately stop, uh, stop using the, that, that group. But we operate through trusted partners, and the, the proof is that they are trusted and partners. Stephen Crabb. Mr. Speaker, last week UNRWA stated that Hamas had stolen fuel, medical supplies, and food that were intended for Palestinians. They then subsequently deleted their, <laughs> that statement. But it's well documented in, in recent years the way that Hamas has repeatedly compromised UNRWA operations in Gaza. So, what assurances can my right honourable friend give that that aid will be uh, targeted correctly and reach the people who so desperately need it? Well, my right honourable friend is right that UNRWA operate in difficult uh, circumstances, but I can tell him that we talk to UNRWA all the time about the proper use of these resources, and we will do everything we can always to make sure they go to the intended place. Sir Britliff. Speaker, my constituents in Harbin Hasenden and myself want to thank um, the Foreign Secretary for all the work he is doing to ensure aid is getting to Gaza, but we know the UN have stated that it needs at least 100 trucks a day to uh, take the aid to those who desperately need it. So can um, my right honourable friend set out what conversations he's having with his Israeli and Egyptian counterparts to make sure that aid is getting where it needs to be? Foreign Office officials uh, and indeed the Foreign Secretary and others are talking to all the relevant authorities in, in Egypt and in Israel. Um, but uh, she, she will understand that the key thing is to increase the number of, uh, of, of lorries that are getting through Rafa. The current number is wholly inadequate, and I talk to Martin Griffiths virtually every day about the operations that the UN are conducting to try and beef up that number. Chris Bimblow. Mr Speaker, uh, yesterday the Prime Minister said that we would finally challenge actions that undercut legitimate aspirations for Palestinian statehood. Uh, none more fundamental than 57 years of the uh, breach of the Fourth Geneva Convention by the illegal occupation of the territories, then with 750,000 Jewish settlers placed in those territories, have made uh, a two-state solution very, very difficult indeed. Or are we actually now going to do something about that? Um, or does he share my concern that the meaningful resolution that the Foreign Secretary referred to may actually include the transfer of the people of Gaza and Gaza itself out of uh, the State of Israel into the hands of another state or some state system, but more concerningly followed by the expulsion of the Palestinians from the West Bank. Well, my right honourable friend has a long-standing and principled view on these matters. Uh, I do not share his uh, view, and uh, nor does the uh, government, and nor do I think the latter part of his question and the specific points that he made are likely to come about. Shadow Minister Lisa Landy. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I just take this opportunity to thank the Development Minister for the constructive cross party way that we've been able to work together since I was appointed to this post in such grim times. <laughs> he will know that every minute counts right now in Gaza. Incubators have been switched off and children are drinking dirty water. Fresh water and power are the most pressing issues. But despite our shared hopes of progress this week, in the convoys that entered Gaza, fuel was not permitted. While several hospitals have been hit, and many given multiple warnings to evacuate. So can he share with the House what the government is doing to help broker an agreement that hospitals are protected and to get fuel into Gaza so that international law is upheld, hospitals can power up and water and power can flow? Yeah. Well, first of all, Mr Speaker, may I welcome the Right Honourable Lady to her 
new position. It's one that I held for five years, Mr. Speaker, from 2005, and I very much hope that she will hold it for five years. And, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, uh, it is it is it is one of the best it is one of the best jobs in opposition and in uh, government. Um, she will also know, in respect of uh, the question that she asked, that we are having humanitarian discussions with everyone, intent as we are on getting uh, relief supplies, humanitarian supplies, through uh, to those who need them. Uh, she asked me specific, uh, specifically about attacking a hospital. Attacking a hospital is a war crime. We should be in no doubt about that. Don't do it. Question number seven, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Following the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh last month, the Government called for an end to the violence, direct talks between parties to the conflict and urgent humanitarian access. We provided £1 million to the International Committee for Red Cross to meet humanitarian needs. And of course, the UN has had access to the region. We encourage Azerbaijan to continue uh, cooperation in this regard. I thank the Minister for his answer, and I also refer the House to my role as Vice Chair of the APPG for Azerbaijan. Can, can he uh, tell the House what support the UK government and indeed British companies are providing in the Karabakh region of Azerbaijan to help clear the landmines laid by Armenian forces, as well as to support the reconstruction of the towns and communities that were destroyed and looted during the occupation? Well, my honourable friend speaks with uh, great knowledge uh, in this subject, and we're, I'm pleased to confirm that the UK is continuing uh, to assess the humanitarian needs in the region, including in relation to demining in Armenia and Azerbaijan. We've provided £1 million to the United Develop UN Development Programme since 2020 to aid demining efforts in both Armenia and Azerbaijan, and our embassy in Baku has had discussions with the Azerbaijani government on reconstruction and reintegration of the region. Chris Law. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, whilst unspeakable horrors unfold in Israel and Palestine, we must not forget other conflicts around the world in which crimes against humanity are being committed against innocent civilians. Following Azerbaijan's military intervention in Nagorno-Karabakh, almost all of the entire ethnic Armenian population has been forced to flee. While over 100,000 people displaced in reports as few as 50 to a maximum of 1,000 remain in the region, does the Minister agree that this bears the hallmarks of ethnic cleansing? Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't agree. Um, but what I should say is that we have urged uh, both sides to resume uh, dialogue. Uh, talks will be the basis of a sustainable peace. I made that point to both uh, foreign, foreign ministers from both countries uh, in recent weeks, and I will be making that point again when I travel to both countries uh, in the coming weeks. Now come to top those others to come. I Number one, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, of course, in response to the uh, terrorist attacks on the 7th of October, uh, I, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister and other ministers across government have engaged intensively with allies in the region. But we are equally determined to deliver on other vital priorities, notably supporting Ukraine, tackling illegal migration, supporting stability in sub-Saharan Africa and alleviating poverty around the world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Foreign Secretary will be aware that the Government of France has announced today that it is sending their Foreign Minister to the United Nations Security Council to arm there for a humanitarian truce in, uh, in, in Gaza, which, in their words, would be capable of leading to a ceasefire and necessary for the distribution of aid to civilian populations. It would also allow the focus to concentrate on the release of hostages, which I would have thought would commend itself also to the Government of Israel. Will her, His Majesty's oh, Government oh, support oh, oh. Can I just say, people want to get on the odd paper, it is not a personal abuse to take all the time. Please, this is topical, short and sweet. You have been here long enough to know that. For a second. Uh, Mr Speaker, I can assure the right honourable gentleman that we are trying to find every we are trying to find every avenue to uh, alleviate uh, humanitarian suffering will be represented at senior ministerial level at the UN Security Council uh, later on uh, today. We want to take action that will actually deliver aid and support to the Palestinian people who are suffering in Gaza. Johnson. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, seven years ago, my Dartford constituent George Lowe was brutally murdered in Cyprus. We know who the killers are. Uh, the Cypriot police know who the killers are, yet they've never been brought to justice. Whilst I accept this is a complicated diplomatic situation, will the Minister please assure the House that the Foreign Office will not rest until justice for George Lowe is forthcoming? 
Okay, my sincere condolences, of course, go out to George Lay's family. Uh, consular staff remain in contact with the Cypriot authorities and family on this case. Uh, we passed a letter from George's family regarding the investigation to the Cypriot authorities and followed up for a response most recently on the 5th of October. And I'm very grateful for the honourable uh, member's uh, uh, advocacy in this case. And of course, we will keep in touch and see what we can do. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, on the 27th of June, this House passed Labour's motion to call on the Government to bring forward legislation within 90 days to seize and repurpose Russian state assets for Ukraine's recovery. But 120 days have now passed since that motion was passed, and we've heard nothing but vague words. When will the Minister when will the Foreign Secretary do what Labour's called for and actually deliver what Ukraine needs, which is the difficult and necessary steps to make sure that Russia pays? <laughs> Uh, Mr Speaker, the state seizure of private assets uh, is a, a very serious act, and it's an act that typically we condemn in, uh, in, other, uh, in other countries. I have made it absolutely clear, the government has made it absolutely clear, that the people who are responsible for brutalising Ukraine will ultimately pay for its reconstruction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my friend, the Foreign Secretary agree that one of the most important messages that Palestinians need to hear from the international community right now is that the two-state solution isn't dead. And can he say a bit more about his discussions with Israeli counterparts about what more can be done to resuscitate faith and optimism in the two-state solution? Uh, my right honourable friend is absolutely right. Having the prospect of a peaceful and secure Israel alongside a peaceful and secure Palestine as a two-state solution is our best route to navigate these terrible situations uh, successfully, and that will remain at the heart of UK foreign policy in the region. Morgan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Minister agree with me that fuel supplies into Gaza is essential to prevent few, uh, further humanitarian catastrophe and to ensure the delivery of aid achieves its full impact? Yeah. Well, I, th I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. We are doing everything we can. He'll understand these are complex negotiations, both to get the food into the region and the other humanitarian supplies, and then to deliver them to those who need it. All I can assure him is that all those negotiations are taking place with both vigour and speed. David Simmons. <laughs> Mr Speaker, on my recent visit to the Pinna United Synagogue, I heard from constituents about the impact of the Hamas terror attack on their family and friends in Israel. Will my right honourable friend restate the commitment that we all share to ensuring that promoters of terror are unable to do their work from the sanctuary of safe countries like ours and to that end work with their allies to prescribe the activities of the IRGC? Uh, with regard to the prescription of the IRGC, my honourable friend will have heard the answer I gave uh, some minutes ago. Um, but the, uh, the work that we are doing to ensure that uh, communities here in the UK uh, feel safe and secure in close relation with the Home Secretary and her team remain, remain an absolute priority for us and ensuring that we uh, limit and ideally stop the ability for organisations and countries to fund terrorism will remain a priority for us. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights said yesterday that immediate and broad humanitarian ceasefire is essential for what goes on in Israel. If more aid for Gazans, including fuel, medicine, food, and water, does not arrive in days, many will die in Gaza. He added that the violence will never end unless leaders stand up and take the brave and humane choices they require by fundamental humanity. Will the Secretary of State heed these calls from the international community and support an immediate humanitarian ceasefire? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Mr Speaker, in order to have a ceasefire, all parties have to agree to it, and I refer him to other answers that have taken place during this session of questions. We are doing everything we can to address the humanitarian problem which he set out, and we will continue to do that. Should instead it. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Building on the legacy of successive governments to the threat of AMR, antimicrobial resistance, will my right honourable friend commit to building a coalition of the higher income countries pledging to improve access to antibiotics, diagnostics, education and prevention, which we all know is vital to stopping AMR? Well, he is absolutely right, Mr Speaker. Uh, AMR is the third biggest killer now. And meetings took place at Unger, and I was there in April as well, uh, attending an AMR uh, meeting. Uh, we will do everything we can, and we are greatly enhanced in our abilities by the presence of uh, Sally Davis, uh, who is the, an envoy on this. Um, and I can tell him it has got the absolute attention of the government. McCarthy. 
50,000 women in Gaza are pregnant, with 5,000 due to give birth now in truly hellish circumstances. If bombing a hospital is, as the Minister just said, a war crime, how would you describe the deliberate withholding of fuel to power those hospitals and keep them working? Yeah. Well, the Honourable Lady is ingeniously asking the same question that she asked earlier. Um, and I, I can tell her that we are doing everything we can. We are doing everything we can to address the issue which she has raised. It is as much a concern to us as it is to her, and we will continue to do that. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It is vital for peace that the rule of law is established and upheld in both Palestine and Israel. Has my right hon. Friend made an assessment of whether the weakening of the judiciary in, in Israel will impact on legal decisions relating to IDF's rules of engagement in the current conflict? Uh, Mr Speaker, my uh, hon. Friend raised an important point, uh, and whilst I was in Israel prior to the 7th of October instance, we of course uh, discussed the proposals for judicial uh, reform. Those proposals have not yet been taken forward uh, by the uh, Israeli government, but I can assure her in the House that we remain committed to international law and will always communicate that to all parties involved. Thank you. If government won't back an actual ceasefire, will it at least consider supporting a humanitarian pause to allow essential supplies to reach the two million civilians trapped in Gaza? Here, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, the government, along with its uh, partners, is doing everything to try and progress humanitarian support and supplies into Gaza. Strong parliamentary democracy is crucial to the Commonwealth, and the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association has a central role as one of the oldest Commonwealth institutions, with you, Mr Speaker, as one of our co-presidents. Uh, my right honourable friend's department acknowledges new legislation is needed to recognise the CPA as an international inter-parliamentary organisation to keep it headquartered here in the UK. When does he plan to have that new legislation in place? Well, my right honourable friend is absolutely right about the extraordinary contribution the CPA make around the world, and we are very anxious to address uh, the issue she, which she has raised and to find a mutually acceptable uh, solution. I hope that this can be done by uh, legislation once parliamentary time allows, but if it is not possible to uh, place it in the King's uh, speech, she will know, as I know, that there are other ways of pursuing the matter. Joanna Charlie. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Does the government agree that there needs to be a full, independent, international inquiry into the recent terrible events in Israel and Gaza, with full access to the Gaza Strip as well as Israel? And does the government agree that only a proper process of accountability for those responsible for the commission of any crimes, including war crimes, identified whether Israeli or Palestinian, that that's the only way forward, and will the government review its position on the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court? Uh, I have no doubt that in the aftermath of these uh, uh, brutal terrorist attacks on the uh, 7th of October and Israeli's re uh, defensive response, there will be an assessment of what has happened. We would want any such assessment uh, to be as comprehensive and independent as possible. Representations to his Pakistan counterpart about deeply worrying human rights abuses committed against Hindus and other minorities, especially women and girls subjected to forced conversion and forced marriage. Notwithstanding the challenges in Israel and Gaza, protecting freedom of religion or belief, including for minority communities, remains central to the UK government's human rights engagements, including in, in Pakistan. My right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, raised the persecution of religious communities, which include Hindus, with Pakistan's Prime Minister on the 25th of September. Lyndon. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. On Saturday, I stood with thousands of Glaswegians whose overwhelming message was clear that we need a ceasefire now. The only way that we can begin to de-escalate this conflict on both sides, a conflict that has led to a humanitarian catastrophe, is by ending the bombardment of Gaza, ensuring the flow of humanitarian aid and creating that space for engaging in diplomacy and dialogue. So, in light of all that, why doesn't the British government call for an immediate ceasefire now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, as we have seen uh, over and over again this morning, calling for a ceasefire is the easy bit. Actually negotiating something meaningful is considerably harder. 
As my right honourable friend has said repeatedly at the dispatch box, we are working with all parties. He makes reference to uh, Israel's uh, actions, but I would remind the House that a ceasefire without Hamas stopping its bombardment of Israel is not a meaningful ceasefire. Dominic Raab. Speaker, last week China put export restrictions on graphite, essential for EV batteries. Four out of ten of the top producers are Commonwealth members. Will the government pursue a partnership agreement on critical minerals, minerals with the Commonwealth to reinforce those supply chains? Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I would like to commend my uh, right hon. Friend uh, for pursuit of a subject which I know uh, from the time he was in my position uh, was very much in his thinking. I can assure him that the uh, uh, critical minerals uh, strategy is something we discuss, I discuss uh, regularly with Commonwealth leaders and others, particularly in Africa. It is in their interest and ours that they uh, protect their own natural resources. Prior. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, let's have another try. Uh, has the International Development Minister had direct discussions with his Israeli counterpart about getting fuel into Gaza? Because once the fuel runs out, hospitals stop and people die. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I, I have not had those discussions with my Israeli opposite number, but he may, he may rest absolutely assured that the contact with the Israeli government, not least through the visit of the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary in the last few days, focuses on every aspect of this uh, issue. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The war in Ukraine is undoubtedly the largest land war in Europe for decades, notwithstanding other pressures around the world. Would my right hon. Friend, the Foreign Secretary, reaffirm the UK's commitment in terms of its support for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people? Uh, Mr Speaker, I can confirm to the House that the uh, Ukraine's ability to defend itself remains a focus of the Government, uh, the Prime Minister, the Defence Secretary, uh, and I discuss this matter regularly. I continue to have uh, regular communications with uh, the Ukrainian uh, Foreign Minister. This may have fallen temporarily from the headlines in the British newspapers. It has not fallen from the minds of the British Government. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. When atrocities take place, we have a duty to call it out. When Hamas murdered and kidnapped innocent civilians, we rightly called it out. And, Mr Speaker, when Putin targeted innocent Ukrainians and Assad targeted hospitals, we expressed our horror in this House. Now we also have a duty to speak on behalf of innocent Palestinians who are being collectively punished, starved and indiscriminately bombed in their own homes by Israeli forces. Children's bodies are lying on the street. It is wrong and it is why we need a ceasefire. So will the Secretary of State convey this to his Israeli counterpart? Uh, Mr Speaker, again, the uh, Honourable Lady asserts her interpretation of uh, international law. It is not necessarily one that is shared by the Government. The preservation, the preservation of all life, uh, including Palestinian life, remains at the forefront of our thinking. Well, Logan. Speaker, uh, what discussions has my right honourable friend had with Minister Kamikawa of Japan and Wang Yi of China in terms of their respective countries' role in easing tensions in the Israel Gaza conflict? I have not had the chance to speak with the uh, Chinese Foreign Minister uh, on this issue, but I have spoken a number of times uh, with the Japanese Foreign Minister on uh, this issue. Of course, we are more than happy to work with any international partner that can alleviate the pain and suffering of both Israelis and the Palestinian uh, people, particularly those in Gaza, and we will continue to do so. Hamilton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am sure the whole House would want to join me in congratulating Nargis Mohammadi on being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for our outstanding work to raise awareness of the struggle for women's rights and equality in Iran. Yeah, Will right. the Minister publicly support the brave women who are campaigning against the forced hijab laws in Iran? And once again, will he commit to prescribing the woman-hating regime that is the IRGC? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, on the prescription of the IRGC, he will have heard the answers I have given a number of times at the dispatch box already, but I can assure him that we continue to stand with the brave women of Iran who are standing up for their rights in the face of the oppression of uh, their government. And indeed, I met with women uh, uh, Iranian uh, campaigners uh, a number of weeks ago, and he and the House should know that we stand in full solidarity with them. Dr Neil Hudson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I pay tribute to the Prime Minister, the Foreign Secretary and their teams for their important diplomatic efforts in the Middle East in recent days. The potential implications of the conflict between Israel and the 
uh, terrorist group Hamas are deeply concerning for the wider region. So, can the Foreign Secretary update the House on the steps the government are taking to prevent this conflict spreading to the wider region? Uh, in the conversations I have with the Israeli government in the uh, immediate aftermath of the 7th of October attacks, they expressed the desire for this to not turn into a regional conflict. That desire was echoed by all the leaders of the Arab world that I have spoken to. It remains an absolute priority for this government and indeed the governments of the region to prevent this turning into a regional conflict. That is exactly what Hamas wants and therefore uh, is exactly what we do not want. Final question, Richard Berger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Isn't it the case that it's simply impossible to get in the scale of aid, of aid needed to end the humanitarian nightmare underway in Gaza without a ceasefire? Well, he's heard the responses, the detailed responses from the dispatch box today on the difficulties that that entails. And I just want to reiterate to him what I said earlier, which is that we are doing everything we can to try and make sure that we help those who are suffering in Gaza today. Complete questions. Right, we now come to the urgent question. John Healy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. To ask the Secretary of State for Defence if he'll make a statement on the war in Ukraine. Minister. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, since I last updated the House in my opening remarks of the debate on Ukraine on the 11th of September, the situation on the ground remains largely unchanged. Slow and steady progress is being made by the Ukrainian armed forces, uh, who uh, continue to grind their way through the main Russian defensive position. Defence intelligence estimate that Russian permanent casualties, in other words, those who are dead or so seriously wounded that they cannot return to action, now stands at between 150 and 190,000 troops. Total casualties are estimated uh, to number up to 290,000. A limited Russian offensive is underway at Ardivka uh, on the outskirts of Donetsk city. Fighting has been fierce, and we assess that the average daily casualty rate for the Russian army was around 800 per day in the first week of the offensive. As ever, Putin and his generals show troops than they do for the people of Ukraine. However, Mr. Speaker, even this ex-soldier can admit that wars aren't only about the fight on the land. Since the last debate on Ukraine, the Ukrainians have opened up a new front in the Black Sea, destroying a Kilo-class submarine and two amphibious ships, as well as a successful strike on the Russian Black Sea Fleet headquarters. The consequence, as President Zelensky has rightly said, is that the Russian Black Sea Fleet is no longer capable of resistance in the Western Black Sea. So, Mr. Speaker, as we move beyond day 600, day 608, to be precise, of Putin's three day illegal war, he's still not achieved any of his initial strategic aims, and he's now ceded sea control in the Western Black Sea to a nation without a navy. Mr. Speaker, the UK continues to donate significant amounts of ammunition and materiel paid for from the £2.3 billion commitment for this financial year, which follows the same amount from the year beforehand. And this is an important point. Our gifting is about more than the headline-making uh, capabilities like Challenger 2 or Storm Shadow. It is in the delivery month after month of tens of thousands of artillery rounds, air defence missiles and other small but necessary equipment that positions the UK as one of the biggest and most influential of Ukraine's donors. The UK is also the only country to have trained soldiers, sailors, aviators and marines in support of the Ukrainian effort. We have now trained uh, over 50,000 uh, soldiers, sailors, aviators and marines since 2014. Mr Speaker, events in the Middle East have dominated the headlines, but in the MOD and across the UK Government, and clearly from Her His Majesty's opposition in that they have brought this urgent question today, Ukraine remains a focus, and I think that it will matter enormously to our friends and colleagues in Kyiv that they see that in this very timely question today. Mr Speaker, I remain every bit as confident today as I have been on all my previous visits to the dispatch box over the last two years that Ukraine can and will prevail. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members across the House and people across the world will be and are rightly focused on the Middle East after Hamas's horrific attacks. This terrorism must be condemned, civilians must be protected, humanitarian corridors opened, international law followed, and escalation risks managed. I welcome the Defence Secretary's Gulf visit later this week, and I hope we'll hear from him in this House to report back. I also welcome uh, President Biden's Oval Office address when he said, Hamas and Putin represent different threats, but they share this in common. They both want to completely annihilate a neighbouring democracy. Today, let President Putin know the UK remains focused on and united in solidarity with Ukraine. Last week, as the Minister said, we passed the grim 600-day milestone since Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine. War still rages. Cities still bombed, civilians still raped and killed. Ukraine has made important gains in recent days on the Dnipro River. Can the Minister update us on this? Mr Speaker, I'm proud of the UK leadership on Ukraine, but we must work to maintain this leadership and accelerate support. And I fear the UK momentum is flagging. No Ukraine statement to Parliament from the new Defence Secretary since his appointment in August. No statement from any Defence Secretary in this House since May. Now, Labour backs the recent UK military aid announcements, new British Army training to protect critical infrastructure, 100 million with allies from the International Fund for Ukraine. But Ukrainians are asking for winter support, for air defence, more ammunition. Where's the UK's planned response? Mr Speaker, no new money for military aid for Ukraine has been committed by this Prime Minister. The £2.3 billion for this year was pledged by his predecessor. The £2.3 billion for last year was pledged by her predecessor. This year's money runs out in March. And seven, year, seven months after announcing £2 billion for UK stockpiles in the spring budget, not a penny has been spent, not a single contract has been signed. Why? Mr Speaker, Putin must be defe defeated just like Hamas must be defeated. We must not step back. We must stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes to win. Well, Mr Speaker, I uh, echo the right hon. Gentleman's words about the despicable attack from Hamas and uh, the absolute right of uh, Israel to defend itself. Um, I also, uh, as I said in my opening response, um, believe very strongly that it's important that Putin does not see this as a moment of opportunity to a sow more chaos, but b to think that somehow the Western donor community is distracted uh, or has a preference to support Israel over Ukraine. He must know that our resolve is to support both. Um, he rightly noted that Secretary of State uh, is in the Gulf uh, later this week, uh, and I'm sure that he will. Um, uh, want to talk about uh, what he hears there, although he will also, I suspect, want to keep some of that council private as we seek to calibrate how we posture ourselves within the region in order to reassure our allies and deter those who might seek uh, to make a bad situation even worse. Um, the Secretary of State was in Washington last week, has had a number of calls with other partners around the region, so too has CDS and I, uh, as part of a wide, an MOD-wide effort to make sure that we are constantly uh, calibrating our response alongside those that we uh, traditionally work with in the region, and we make sure that nothing that we do is misinterpreted. Um, Mr Speaker, the Right Honourable Gentleman and I, I, I think, are friends, uh, and, uh, and so it is su with some dismay that uh, he dismisses all of my efforts at the dispatch box to keep the House updated on the war in Ukraine. Uh, I have uh, stood here uh, as recently as the 11th of September to lead a, an excellent debate on the matter and given a number of statements uh, on the Secretary of State's behalf. Um, I'm sorry if he is so rank conscious as to deem my efforts unworthy, but I have done my best. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the right honourable gentleman is absolutely right to uh, point to the fact that the excellent uh, financial contribution that has been made over the two previous financial years is as yet unconfirmed for the next financial year. It will not surprise him to know that that 
has already been the subject of conversation across government. It's not for me to make that announcement in a UQ or statement today, but a major fiscal event is forthcoming, and so I know he won't have to wait too long. But, Mr Speaker, that doesn't mean that our plans are uncertain. Um, and in fact, I push back quite strongly on the suggestion that they are. I think that for a long time over the last two years there's been a sort of uh, a, a misunderstanding that the UK's capacity to gift is, is entirely either from our own stockpiles or from our own ind indigenous industrial capacity. The vast majority of what the UK gifts is what we're able to buy internationally, often from countries that Putin would prefer weren't providing us with that stuff, but we have been able to get our hands on it and get it to the Ukrainians with some haste. And that is exactly the sort of thing that the Honourable Gentleman asked about. It is the small but necessary things, the winterisation uh, equipment, the small arms ammunition, the artillery ammunition, the air defence ammunition. So our ability to buy that whilst in parallel stimulating UK industry, and I reject what he said about campaign, uh, contracts having not been placed. Substantial contracts have been placed to directly replenish UK stockpiles for Enlaw, Starstreak, LLM, Javelin, Brimstone 155 and 556 rifle rounds. Um, so, Mr Speaker, as far as I can see, there is a steady state contribution to the Ukrainians that amounts into the tens of thousands of rounds per month, plus air defence missiles, plus all of the small stuff, alongside the replenishment of our own stockpiles, which of course can only happen at the pace at which industry can generate, but nonetheless it is happening. Hello, Shelbrook. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, my right honourable friend will um, be well aware of the situation in the Black Sea in terms of sea mines and the way they're breaking loose. And our allies in Turkey are doing an incredible job in maintaining control convention and trying to keep those sea lanes safe. May I ask my right honourable friend if he's having any conversations with our Turkish allies about any support they may need in no matter what way um, to try and make sure that if they can get the grain deal up and running again and get grain out through maritime, um, of the, they need any support to try and make those sea lanes safe because we are aware that sea mines are indeed breaking free. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, my right honourable friend uh, is an expert on these matters and can I commend him for the work that he and colleagues around the House do as part of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly um, to ensure that parliaments across NATO stand united uh, in our support for Ukraine. He rightly notes the importance of the Montreux Convention in keeping non-home ported ships out of the Black Sea uh, and the Turks have applied that uh, inscrutably. Uh, it is, I think Turkey is entirely competent and comfortable in its ability to continue to enforce the Convention. Clearly, for other Black Sea nations like Romania and Bulgaria, demining is already a concern and something that they are getting on with. I met with my Romanian counterpart at the Warsaw Security Forum only two weeks ago to discuss exactly that. Martin Docker to use the SNP spokesperson. Uh, we cannot forget uh, this autumn, Mr. Speaker, seeing a broader escalation of the conflict in Ukraine into the frontiers of our Euro Atlantic homeland. Uh, and I speak in particular about the recent announcements by the governments of Sweden, Finland, and Estonia that undersea assets linking those countries have been intentionally damaged by third parties. I should declare uh, an interest as the chair of the All Party Group uh, in Estonia. But my primary concern, I'm sure shared by the Minister, is closer to home. As events in Eastern Mediterranean and Baltics demonstrate the diffuse nature of the threats we need to face, so, so they also demonstrate the importance of keeping a singular focus on the areas this government can best hope to influence. Now, while supporting the heroic and excellent bilateral support of the people of Ukraine as they continue their fight, on the day the Defence Select Committee publishes a report into the government's Indo-Pacific tilt, can I ask the Minister to reiterate his government's commitment to the Euro-Atlantic security is a central strategic concern of these islands of the North Atlantic we inhabit together, and to critically to update the House on the security of our North Sea oil and gas infrastructure. Here, here. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, it's fantastic to hear the SNP having an epiphany about the strategic importance of North Sea oil and gas. Um, and uh, I... Uh, we take very seriously the requirement to protect our subsea infrastructure, whether it be uh, oil and gas or whether it be fibre optic cables or energy interconnectors. And the Royal Navy uh, has ships permanently at high readiness in order to assure that our 
uh, national economic uh, zone is secure. Now, the, 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 the point that the Honourable Gentleman makes is, is an important one, which is, is a time of growing instability in the Euro-Atlantic and the Near East a time to also be committing uh, more military resource to the Far East and the Indo-Pacific? And every defence review, the original integrated review and its refresh, was clear that the absolute foundation of all of our military effort is around security in the Euro-Atlantic. But if our principal ally in the United States is ever more concerned, as it is, about its competition with China and the challenge in the Indo-Pacific, it is necessary, surely, to show our willingness to contribute to Indo-Pacific security alongside the United States so that the United States, Mr Speaker, remain engaged in Euro-Atlantic security too. Dr Julian Lewis. Sir Julian. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, before um, uh, uh, I ask my actual question, may I just briefly quote from the former Defence Secretary, um, my right honourable friend for Wire and Preston North, who, in an important article in the Daily Telegraph at the beginning of October, said, Before I left office, I asked the PM to match or increase the $2.3 billion pledged to Ukraine this year to add to the $4.6 billion we've spent already. The UK is maybe the biggest European donor Germany is. Uh, does the Minister agree that this is a helpful exchange of views because it will enable him and his team to go to the Treasury and express how united the House is yeah, yeah. Uh, on the need to continue this very important, indeed decisive level of contribution to the fight of Ukraine for freedom? Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, the previous Defence Secretary never needed any help from me in making his case to Prime Ministers. Um, he is, of course, absolutely right that the UK has won its position as uh, leading the global donor community uh, because we have resourced that commitment. We have been willing to go through capability thresholds before anybody else. But our position as a leader internationally depends on our continued willingness to do so. Um, the previous Secretary of State, the current Secretary of State and indeed the Prime Minister and the Chancellor are all on the same page about the importance of maintaining that UK position. Derek to it. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can I just say to the Minister that I completely agree with the comments made and the concerns raised by my right more friend, the Shadow Secretary of State. Can I also say to the Minister, uh, and part of the reason why we want the Secretary of State here as well, is because we really do need to up the game in terms of convincing the British people why it's absolutely essential we keep the massive and the ongoing support for the Ukraine and the importance of defeating Russia. Now, can I just say to the Secretary of State, it follows on from the last question, it's clear that Ukraine needs more resources, whether that's equipment, munitions, armaments, etc. And they really do need to step up even further. So can I say to the, sec to the Minister, will he go back and talk to the Secretary of State and his colleagues in Cabinet and say we really do need to put more resources into supporting Ukraine? Yeah. Minister. Um, well, Mr Speaker, the, the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right that we should not take for granted the cross-party and national consensus that has existed about support for Ukraine and that all of us in this House continue to stand in solidarity with the Ukrainian armed forces and I think we set the tone that the media and the nation follows but it is a significant amount of money at a time when everybody else around the cabinet table will also be seeking uh, resource for their departments and so we must as the honourable gentleman says make the case but the case as far as I can tell is a relatively well is a completely compelling one what the Ukrainians are doing is standing up to our main adversary, the nation that challenges security in the Euro-Atlantic, and it is through our support for them that we are making a very clear stand about how we want the Euro-Atlantic to be, and in so doing, reassuring all of our NATO allies along NATO's eastern frontier of our resolve to stand up to Russian aggression and with them under the terms of NATO's treaties. Sir Bernard. Yes, you, May I? very much welcome my right honourable friends clarity about how absolutely critical it is for the security of the world 
and the rules-based international order that there is a successful outcome for Ukraine in this conflict? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And can he do everything he possibly can to make sure that the critical long-term, uh, lo longer-range missiles and air defence systems, which are having a very detrimental effect on the Russian armed forces, uh, continues to get through? And may I just add my voice to my right honourable friend, the uh, member for New Forest East. Uh, we, we take it as read that the extra money will be announced in the autumn statement uh, at least as much, if not more, than before in order to help sustain Ukraine in this dreadful conflict. Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I completely agree with my right honourable friend about the need to maintain our support for the Ukrainian armed forces. Um, there are a number of step change capabilities that will come into Ukrainian hands over the next 12 months or so, most obviously combat air. And the UK, whilst not an F-16 nation, is a part of the F-16 coalition and is doing the basic truck pilot training uh, before they go on to F-16 nations for conversion. And I know that the Prime Minister agrees with all in the House who make the case for the need to us to continue to support Ukraine into the next financial year. Richard Ford. Thank you, Mr. There's been lots of interest in recent days, quite rightly, about the law of armed conflict, a subject of which the Minister knows from his own time serving in the armed forces. While the conflict in Israel and Gaza has rightly made us reflect on the protection of innocent civilians, we have seen a war in the last couple of years in Ukraine in which Russia has shown little regard for civilians. What does the Minister understand by the term proportionality in the context of the war in Ukraine? Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I think that some of the false equivalents that uh, Lavrov and others from the Russian government have sought to create is deeply misguided. Um, the point of proportionality is not an eye for an eye. It is not a numerical thing. It is around military necessity in order to achieve legitimate and proportionate military aims. It is clear in the way that Putin has prosecuted his war, most obviously in somewhere like Mariupol, but actually in the way that he has systematically targeted civilian infrastructure, not as part of the initial shaping of a legitimate military operation, but as part of a very deliberate, sustained campaign to terrorise the Ukrainian people, that there is no equivalence between what is happening between, uh, in Gaza at the moment and what has been happening in Ukraine. And we must stand up every time that Lavrov or his cronies try to make the opposing point, to be very clear on what the difference under international humanitarian law is. Sir Bill uh, Mr Speaker, it cannot be a uh, 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 extraordinary that on the same day that the Russians assaulted Avdivka, Iranian-backed Hamas decided to commit their murderous uh, assault on Israel. We cannot fight Hamas, but we can do so much more to crush their Russian allies. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, Mr Speaker, I think it's very important that uh, I don't suggest that we have any evidence that somehow uh, the Kremlin and Hamas were coordinating in the awful events of what happened two Saturdays ago. But I think that what we have seen is the Kremlin are incredibly effective at spotting opportunities that are presented to them in which to further subvert and destabilise. We have seen that in coups across Western Africa and we have seen it in the way that Putin quickly moved um, to contribute to a challenging narrative to the West over what happened uh, in Israel two Saturdays ago. John McDonnell. The calculation so far, and I know it is difficult getting exact numbers, but the numbers of Ukrainian troops wounded is anything between 100,000 and 120,000, and civilians estimate about 18,000. Could the Minister tell us what support is being provided to Ukraine for their health services to help cope with the wounded and the injured, and what support has been given with regard to specialist service link-ups between the UK and Ukraine, also to provide the best support we can? Minister. Well, good morning, Madam. Good afternoon, Madam Speaker. Um, you're, the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right uh, that there are significant casualties on the Ukrainian side too. Less, it's important to note, than have been suffered 
on the Russian side. Those are both military and civilian. On the military side, there is a coalition of nations, just as there are with all other types of capability to provide military aid. There are UK medics uh, based in Lviv as part of that. When I was in Zhezhov uh, in Poland just uh, two weeks ago, uh, my plane pulled up alongside a uh, a German Air Force plane that was about, or Swedish Air Force plane that was about to evacuate uh, Ukrainian troops back to Sweden. In addition, the UK is re rehabilitating uh, some of the uh, troops injured on the Ukrainian side back here in our rehabilitation facilities. In addition to that, as part of the wider support that the UK government provides to Ukraine, there is, of course, always looking for opportunities to support the wider humanitarian and civilian medical services too. Robert Courts. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. May I return to uh, stockpiles and supply chains? Uh, the Minister is absolutely right that the UK has been providing a great deal of material, but we need a steady supply of orders that is necessary to restock our own cupboards and to supply the Ukrainians. Could he outline what he's doing to make sure we have that supply chain resilience? And could he also reassure me that he'll keep a laser-like focus on the logistics capacity that is needed to get kit from here to there? Minister. Well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, my honourable friend is right on both counts. Firstly, that the industrial capacity needs to be re established in order not just to replenish our supply chains, it shouldn't, and this is an important point. The Department isn't seeking simply to make a single order to replace whatever has been uh, gifted to the Ukrainians. Instead, we're looking to create orders that run on and on and on so the industrial capacity can be maintained. Those contracts are being placed as the industrial capacity comes online, uh, and in the meantime, other contracts are being placed that allow a more like for like replenishment from uh, stockpiles elsewhere in the world. He's also right, however, that having all of the industrial capacity and having all of the fighting echelon is only. It only works if you've got the logistic enablers to match them all up, and we're making investment in that as set out in the Defence Command Paper refresh as well. Judith Cummins. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. We must not forget Ukraine, and we must continue to stand with Ukraine. But the war effort in Ukraine relies on a strong supply chain here in the UK, and a crucial part of that supply chain, GMB members at Defence Equipment and Support, who assemble and transport missiles for the front line, have had to take weeks of industrial action over unfair pay. <coughs> Ukrainian politicians and trade unions have urged a resolution to this dispute because they know how valuable these workers are. Will the Minister join with me and do the same? Minister. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm unfamiliar with the issue of which she speaks, and so I wouldn't want to comment on the fly. Um, but clearly, those who work within uh, our excellent defence industry do very important work. Uh, in my experience, many of them see themselves as contributing to a national endeavour and are motivated by patriotism every bit as much as they are money. And I hope that they will continue to work as hard as they have been so that we can support our own armed forces as well as those of Ukraine. James Sunderland. Madam Speaker, given that precision remotely piloted and autonomous weapon systems, not to mention close air support, could be decisive to an attritional land campaign. Could the Minister please update the House on the delivery of air power to Ukraine? Minister. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, I said in response to an earlier question about the F-16 coalition, uh, which is a combination of both gifting the jets uh, and the munitions and the pilot training. Um, I have nothing really to add to that beyond what I said earlier, other than it is expected that those capabilities will arrive with the Ukrainians within the next 12 months, and clearly everybody is working to do so as quickly as possible. Stuart MacDonald. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. If the news is to be believed this morning, we are about to see another German U-turn on this time on providing Taurus missiles, just as we saw a U-turn on Leopards, just as we saw a U-turn on the F-16s. Indeed, right across the NATO, uh, the Ukraine contact group, we keep seeing this same pattern of countries dragging their heels on a certain capability, only to finally give in in the end. Admittedly, that doesn't include the minister and the government. But why does this keep happening in the contact group? And would he just say a bit more about how the training for F-16 pilots is going? Minister. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm uh minded to be much more charitable to nations who have uh, 
again and again and again challenge themselves to go through a capability threshold, often uh, one that the UK has demonstrably gone through first. And for the Germans, if you take the position that they have traditionally taken to where they are now post-Titan vendor, it is extraordinary the level of gifting that they are now providing. And so I think it's invidious for me to be in any way critical. In fact, I'll go the other way and say how full of admiration I am for the way that German policy has shifted so completely over the last two years. Sarah Atherton. Speaker, they say infantry wins battles, but logistics wins wars. But with Western stockpiles diminished, uh, what conversations has the Minister had with the defence industry sector about supporting Ukraine to produce and manufacture their own munitions? Minister. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, as keen a follower as Defence Affairs will have spotted that the Chief Executive of BAE Systems was in Kyiv uh, at the back end of the summer, and BAE have already announced their intention to manufacture uh, in Ukraine. That is clearly something that the British Government supports, uh, and we will look at how uh, more widely UK industry can not only support our support for Ukraine through the UK MOD, but can increasingly manufacture directly in support of the Ukrainians. Tamanjit Singh Dasi. Thank you very much. Madam Deputy Speaker, due to Putin's illegal invasion of a sovereign neighbouring nation, Ukraine is, is now the most heavily mined country on earth, leading to countless deaths of innocent civilians. So, as the Ukrainians continue making progress with their counter offensive, what steps is the Defence Minister taking to significantly expand our support in providing mine clearing equipment to Ukraine? Minister. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, with the exception of the northern Kharkiv Oblast, which was recovered at some pace last autumn, I'm not sure that the front line has moved anywhere near enough to start to talk about a civilian demining effort uh, in the defensive belts that have been laid over the last year or so. Um, the, the, uh, the Honourable Gentleman, I think, from his gesticulation is suggesting that the, uh, the progress that's been made over the last four or five months is such that the 30-kilometre defensive belt that was well seeded with mines by the Russians is still very much within artillery range and a part of the offensive action or the defence uh, against Ukraine that is happening at the moment. He's absolutely right, however that the use of mines, even anti-armour mines, not just anti-personnel mines, um, is uh, an appalling reality of modern warfare and that there must be some urgency in clearing up the battlefield thereafter. But I would just gently suggest that the military facts don't lend themselves to any effort such as that right now. Jason McCart. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. With the world quite rightly focusing on the Middle East, I really welcome this question as an opportunity for us to show our solidarity with Ukraine once again. And can I just say I really welcome the Labour front bench likening Hamas and Putin as barbaric bedfellows in trying to annihilate neighbouring democracies. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, at a recent NATO Parliamentary Assembly summit, uh, we had a briefing from Colonel Maxim Supran, commander of the 66th the Mechanised Brigade of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. He talked about the urgent need for more anti-tank weaponry, unmanned aerial systems, electronic warfare capability and, of course, ammunition. How is the Minister making sure that we can deliver the munitions and military capabilities that the Ukrainian Armed Forces so bravely need on the front line to defend their democracy? Minister. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, for over two years now, the UK MOD alongside the US DOD have had an incredibly strong relationship with the Ukrainian Ministry of Defence. And it's through those relationships at the political level, at the military level, and indeed the connections between our defence procurement agencies that allow us to have such a close understanding of what the Ukrainian requirement is, not just for the fight right now, but also for the fight in six months' time. We'll continue to maintain those relationships. We'll continue to invest in the resources that are needed. The thing that guides us, quite obviously, is what the Ukrainians need to stay in the fight tonight, tomorrow, and to eventually prevail. And everything that sets out to procure on their behalf is with those plans in mind. Joanna Chet. Thank you, Madam 
Madam Deputy Speaker. While we all stand with Ukraine, there is consider considerable concern about the likely length of the war. And earlier this month, uh, I attended the Pentlands Ukrainian Support Group, which is supported by uh, Curry and Balerno Rotary Club in my constituency and is a support group for Ukrainian refugees in, in Edinburgh South West. And many of the women there were asking me what will become of them if the war continues and their three-year visas uh, are up. And I just wondered whether the Minister has had any discussions with the Home Office about the need to extend humanitarian visas to Ukrainians or indeed to look at giving them indefinite leave to remain. Minister. Madam Deputy Speaker, those are not conversations that I've had, but since the Honourable Lady has mentioned it, I will undertake to have them. Um, and I would reflect, firstly, I'd commend her local Rotary Club in leading the support of the Ukrainian Committee, uh, the, the, the Ukrainian community in her constituency. And it is a really uncomfortable reality that everything I would want to say to her constituents, just as I want to say to the Ukrainians who are living in my own constituency, is don't worry, this will be over soon, you'll be home soon. But the reality is, is that this probably will take a while longer yet, and it is really important that when we stand up in this House, we show to Putin our resolve to support the Ukrainians for as long as it takes, with whatever it takes, even if that takes years, because Putin must not think that the West will lose patience. Alan Kerr. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, depriving Russia from revenue from oil sales was a, is a central platform to the West's response to uh, uh, Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, Twelve months ago, some significant efforts were made and, and had a significant effect. But the NATO Parliamentary Assembly just weeks ago uh, heard evidence that all of those blockades have now been circumvented and that Russia's oil revenue has increased. What action is my honourable friend taking to work with international allies to see what else can be done in this dynamic environment? Minister. Well, clearly, Madam Deputy Speaker, it is a cause of enormous concern where international sanctions regimes are not working as intended. Um, if I may, I will follow up with the Honourable Gentleman and his colleagues on the Parliamentary Assembly to understand exactly what it was that they heard, um, speak to colleagues in the Foreign Office about that, and perhaps write to him and his Parliamentary Assembly colleagues uh, with a government response. Andrew Gwynne. Thank you. At the end of last month, the Defence Secretary suggested that the UK training of uh, Ukrainian troops could be moved in country into Ukraine. He also suggested uh, there might be a possibility of UK warships on the Black Sea. Can he say whether those plans still stand? Minister. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I heard a slightly different statement um, and one that I think is self evidently true. Um, in a post-war Ukraine, the UK will absolutely seek to demonstrably support Ukrainian security, both on land and at sea and in the air. But very obviously, that is not something that you would do whilst the conflict was still live, for very obvious reasons. Stephen McPartland. I welcome the government's commitment to Ukraine, and I'm proud the Stevenage-based NVDA supplies Storm Shadow and Brimstone missiles. But we know from a recent report by Russia's open source intelligence team that North Korea is now massively supplying Russia. Are there any plans to work with international partners to try and disrupt that supply or increase our supplies? Minister. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, I think that there are a number of uh, outcomes that one might say reflect strategic defeat for Putin. Finland and Sweden joining NATO, growing distrust of Russia throughout its near abroad, and more recently having to go to countries like North Korea cap in hand to seek weapons because they're unable to sustain their own arms industry, not to mention the very rapidly changing dynamic between Russia and China. Um, of course, the UK and our allies look at ways of disrupting Russian supply chains, but that would not necessarily be a matter that we would discuss any further in public. Gavin Robinson. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Minister will have heard concern raised in a number of places about the potential for a, a loss of focus or a lack of resolve given the pivot of interest and attention to the Middle East and the harrowing scenes of the last fortnight. And he has robustly responded to those concerns. 
But a second element of concern, and he invoked the spectre of uh, our main ally, the United States, is the political turmoil and turbulence that appears to be going on in Congress mm-hmm. and the dissolution of the resolve that was rightly there for Ukraine mm-hmm. in certain political circles. I am not asking the Minister to solve that as a problem, mm-hmm. but is he concerned by it? And can he assure this House that through the engagement he has had with his counterparts within the United States that in the executive tier their resolve is undiminished and that they will find the resource to continue their support for Ukraine? Minister. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Secretary of State was in Washington last week, and that, indeed uh, his meeting there was the third meeting he had had with Secretary Austin um, since uh, he was appointed. Within the executive, there is absolutely no change in approach whatsoever. But actually, furthermore, Madam Deputy Speaker, from although what we see in the news might suggest that there is growing impatience or lack of resolve within Congress, that is definitely not uh, what we are hearing in our engagements with uh, colleagues uh, in Congress. Um, I think America has a very strong sense of what its role in the world is, what this moment of challenge is. And I think that despite whatever domestic politics may or may not be playing out, the resolve of Congress to stand firm on the side of freedom is as strong as it's always been. Dr Luke Evans. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And earlier on, the Minister highlighted the um, developments in the Black Sea. Clearly, that is so important with regards to grain and feeding the world. Could he update the House on what the Government's position is on the Black Sea Grain Initiative and how we can make sure the grain is getting out to feed the world? Minister. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Government continues to be affronted by the idea that grain to feed the world should be traded as some part of, uh, as part of some deal. Uh, the Turks have shown admirable leadership in seeking to facilitate the movement of grain uh, out of the Black Sea. The UK continues to support those initiatives. Um, but if I may, Madam Deputy Speaker, I will write to him with a more fulsome uh, response on the Black Sea Grain Initiative specifically. Emma Hardy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Recently met with Ukrainian refugees in my constituency, and they're really worried about this war lasting a lot longer than was originally anticipated. And what they really want is security to know that they can remain safe here in the UK for as long as this appalling war continues past the date of the 31st of December 24. So I wonder what conversations the Secretary of State has had with the Home Office about ensuring that Ukrainian refugees who are here can continue to remain here in safety for as long as they need to. Minister. Um, Madam Speaker, I think the Honourable Lady might have been momentarily distracted. The the exact same question came up ten minutes or so ago, uh, but I will add her name to the Honourable Ladies uh, in my conversations with Home Office Ministers. Simon Fell. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, Providing materiel, support, logistical uh, cover is crucial to pushing back uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine, but so is a strong sanctions regime. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, earlier today a worrying report surfaced saying that whilst the UK has banned Russian um, copper, aluminium and nickel, the EU has not done the same as they deem them to be critical minerals. I wonder if my right honourable friend could update the House as to what the government is doing to make sure we present a united front in our battle against Russia. Minister. When it comes to EU sanctions on Russian critical minerals, the honourable gentleman has exposed the significant flaw in my knowledge. Uh, I'll need to write to him. Alex Sobel. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'd like to first thank the Shadow Secretary of Defence for calling this urgent question as the co-chair of the Ukrainian refugee and the minister for his update. In his update, he spoke about the new phase of the war, particularly important phase of the war regarding the Black Sea and Crimea. And Ukraine will not be free until every Russian soldier has left Crimea. I know the Minister of Defence has trained seeking pilots, has delivered seekings, I understand three seekings, but these are for search and rescue. What naval aid is the UK supplying to Ukraine for this next phase of the war, which will be vital? Minister. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the UK has provided uh, a number of uh, capabilities that have been used by uh, the Ukrainians in their effort in the Black Sea. None of those are explicitly naval, but the challenge with the Montreux Convention is that the minesweepers, for example, two of them that the Royal Navy has transferred 
to the nascent Ukrainian Navy can't enter the Black Sea whilst the Montreux Convention is in place, and that, of course, puts a constraint on our ability to generate a genuine naval capability uh, until the Montreux Convention is lifted. Kevin Foster. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. When Putin launched his attack on Ukraine, he not only expected to conquer a neighbouring democracy, but to split the international community. Instead, he united it, because people cannot remain neutral when we see this type of behaviour go on. The biggest rebuff to him will be a strengthened and enlarged NATO. So what conversations is he having, particularly with his Turkish and his Hungarian counterparts, about ensuring ratification of Sweden's membership it proceeds forthwith? Minister. Well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, it remains uh, our firm expectation that Sweden will accede to NATO, uh, and we continue to press all allies to ensure that that happens sooner rather than later. It's also of note, and there's been a great deal of discussion of this in the Swedish media, that it is increasingly in Putin's interest to stir up some of the activities that have been happening in Sweden precisely to affront the sensibilities of some other NATO allies. And it's important we've all got our eyes open to that possibility. Thank you. That concludes proceedings on the urgent question. And we will now proceed. I'm just pausing for a moment to allow a change of dramatis personae. And now we proceed to the statement. Minister Robert Jenrick. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And with permission, I'd like to make a statement on illegal migration. This government has made it our top priority to stop the boats because these crossings are not only illegal, dangerous and unnecessary, but they're also deeply unfair. They're unfair on those genuinely in need of